we set up the the dummy for uh, Dimension to, to practice his slinging on, and I ended up becoming the dummy because he can't hit a standing dummy worth crap. <laughs> You know, yeah, was that like, was funny oh, too because oh. he's like how did i get destruction xp i look over and the dummy is in front of my house great guys thanks stay the survival podcast bringing you survival game news Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's podcast, where we're going to be talking about an early access that we got our hands on called Sengoku Dynasty. In case you don't know who we are, my name is Yarl of Goats, and the guys here at the Survive State of Survival podcast, we're big fans of survival games, and we love discussing gameplay, upcoming news, as well as potential for new releases. Let's go ahead and see what our staff has been doing so far. How's it going, Dump Graw? It's going, going pretty well. It's been going pretty well. I've been uh, busy behind the scenes, taking care of our social media, replying to posts and po posting art and stuff, as well as uh, getting some feedback on the question that you posted recently, Yara, which was pretty fun to do. But one of the things that I have been doing behind the scenes was I was making a video for Jay-Z 1.22 update, which just dropped today, folks. In the state of survival, we're going to be trying to make more of these short form videos on game updates and other kind of things covering the games like Jarl said that we're supposed to be doing, not just the podcast. But today we were able to do the Daisy update 1.22 video, which I have just linked inside of our uh, chat and in, will be inside of our description in the video after this. So check it out, folks. Other than that, folks, I actually just became a uncle again to a beautiful niece that my brother just had he is very proud the baby is very healthy and the mama is doing quite fine so i am actually quite pleased nowadays but that's kind of it for me all right thank you dump and red what's been going on in your side of the woods yeah so i was gonna say dump that uh, 1.22 patch video that you did was really fantastic i think that that uh got a lot of coverage in a short amount of time so kudos to you sir um, and speaking of 1.22, um, you know, been been doing some testing of experimental and then holding my breath for one stable release this morning uh, because there there are sometimes some hidden things they do at the last minute. Um, ended up spending uh, most of my lunchtime uh, uninstalling completely and reinstalling Daisy to get it to work correctly. Um, so that was fun. And uh, just doing some uh, video editing and, and trying to put together some additional content for the podcast other than the podcast itself. Awesome. Thank you very much, Red. And on my side of the table, I've been dealing with a lot. Tomorrow, we normally play Dungeons and Dragons over on the Twitch channel, but we will be canceling that because I think two or three of our uh, party members all live in the wake of those hurricanes that are coming. So for anybody down in that part of the country, please stay safe. I know with the hurricanes in California and the hurricanes in the southeast, it's been a rough one. After that, we're going to be doing our early access uh, or the early release of Starfield. So we're going to be playing that for uh, the foreseeable future, as well as on Saturday, Fallout Aurora, which is the 2D20 tabletop RPG by Modifius. But today I am excited to start talking about a game that wasn't really on my radar, but since I am a fan of the Dynasty games, I wanted to get into it and see what kind of release information there was. But we're going to be talking about Sengoku Dynasty. For those of you who are familiar with Medieval Dynasty, uh, and the reason why I'm not comparing it to the earlier titles is it's almost a clone of that. I definitely recommend you check it out if that's a gameplay that you love. I think they're sticking true to a design that works for them, unlike the Wild West Dynasty early access they released. However, it's still a little rough around the edges being an early alpha. It is the second alpha release since Medieval Dynasty, and it is nice to see that it's been in a better state. But it was released on August 10th, and so far it hasn't let us down for what it is. But more about that after our hot takes. So, Dump, last week we got to play on our server with Life is Futile, which, uh... The first time we played, we had an interesting issue with the animals not working, but I genuinely had a blast with our Life is Feudal playthrough. How about you? Oh, yeah, I definitely had a blast. 
This is the kind of game, actually this is one of the games that I could literally pick up and play with anybody and still enjoy myself. Not because I fan my boy over it so hard, but because how much fun it is to play with other people. I've played this game by myself plenty of times, and you know what? It's just boring. It's a fun game, don't get me wrong, but again, without someone to play it with, a lot of its uh, desire or appeal uh, quickly fades away. Oh, I agree. I think one of the nuances of this game and the reason why I like it a lot is you can't be an expert at everything. You have a finite number of skill points and it really requires a community. You actually have to have farmers. You have to have blacksmiths. You have to have warriors. You have to have people who work in herbalism and kind of a mix of all of them, depending on how small your community is. Um, there's so many artisanal skills too, which I actually appreciate because a lot of times in survival games, those artisanal skills kind of get left behind. Oh yeah, definitely. <sighs> That's one of the cool things about Life is Feudal is that you can't be good at everything. And there are two reasons why that is. One is because of the skill points, like you point out. But the other point is because of the grind to gain those skill points. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I love, is that two-layered system. Because even if you can have all of the points to gain every single one of those skills in that screenshot we're showing, uh, which, you know, is the artisan, blacksmithing, forging, leather making, woodworking. There's so many there. I think there's like 26 in there. Um... It's the grind that really holds you because to get go all the way up to, I think, a level 90 in one skill takes the effort of like, I think it's like well over uh, 12 hours of straight grinding. And that's if you're getting the maximum food buff. So even if you have the max skill points, which is 3000 to level up every skill, if you leave it on the normal level up speed, there's no way you're going to be able to do that. So that's why it's so much fun to play with friends because it really does do that right y'all it really fosters that community and I it, it really that. it really does and the one thing i will say about it that i appreciate about it is let's say blacksmithing that's one of the things that people can relate to when it comes to medieval technology if you want to be able to make plate mail and all of those arms and armaments then you're going to have to invest a lot of time into that skill and although, like Dump said, if you're trying to sit there and do it in one sitting, 12 hours straight, it can be quite the grind, let alone the fact that you need people to bring you resources in order to make your stuff. However, the one thing I like about it is once you hit that expert level, you become an incredibly valuable member of the community, and it really gives you a sense of worth that you made it that far. That goes for, uh, you know, the pottery, that goes for farming, that goes for any, uh, even hunting, some of the things that you can make by gathering skin, furs, and other materials to be able to make food, cook elaborate meals so that your buffs are stronger than the basic meat over a fire. It really does give every person on your team their own place. And more importantly, it doesn't jeopardize that old medieval trope of a king calling upon the peasantry to fight in a war, because combat skills are done separately too. So you could just build a, a dummy, a target dummy, and sit there and work on your melee or your ranged attacks, depending on what kind of warrior you want to be. Yeah, the game definitely plays into uh, the idea that there can be people who can be knights or spearmen or bowmen and crossbowmen, but also even plays into even the peasantry kind of side of things. There's an entire combat skill line that 100% reflects using pitchforks and other kind of weaponry that like you would laugh at but in this game some of that stuff is very lethal because back in the medieval ages some of the uh peasant tools actually it's kind of funny because uh you know we're going to be talking about here is some of the peasant tools actually can be lethal and they were actually adapted to become real weaponry over time in medieval as well as in the upcoming game we're going to chat about in feudal japan uh you know the farmer's tools became something more than just farmer's tools which is really cool but talking about the importance of a person this is one of those games that i really love and you really nailed it on the head y'all yes being a level 90 blacksmith is super important but the person who moves dirt is just as um, isn't, isn't as important but is absolutely a necessity and it's not a necessity of 
oh, well, who cares about you? Because you need those people to be able to build your buildings, to build that forge, to build those uh, stockpiles, to get those war horses trained, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't have someone terraforming for you or moving dirt for you to make those flat areas, and you don't have someone planning out your future village, man, oh man, can it get very problematic pretty quickly. So it's crazy how even the lowest tier person can have a, or lowest tier job, I would say, can have such a great impact on the future of the kingdom just as much as mm -hmm. a level 90 blacksmith can. And it's funny that you mentioned the future of the kingdom. As you may know, I've been trying to launch an RP server for the community for space engineers for some time. And that's kind of difficult because role playing and space engineers, it's almost like you have to create this separate element for everything to work. Then you have to artificially give people ranks and positions. But this game, it feels like it's almost bred for that role playing tendency where you have an entire kingdom, you have the king, of course, and then you've got his knights who are going to be excellent in combat, probably mayors of towns if you want to be historically accurate. So they represent your taxation, they represent handling the communities in your kingdom. And it's just so phenomenal to have a need for even the most infinitesimal mundane job to find those experts for. And to the point of you saying that the peasants are actually deadly, the coolest thing about the combat tree is as you level in it, you can get formations and different combat abilities unlocked based off of the way that you fight. And the peasants have some really cool ones, so much so that if you piss your peasantry off, they could actually be a threat if they decided in the roleplay storyline to rebel against the soldiers and the king. So it... I haven't seen any other game that's like that. You know, in Minecraft, if you have somebody go farm, that is a boring existence. <laughs> well, just talking about the peasant warfare, it really brings up the term they had in the medieval ages. Um, the, that of the people often is the leader of the people. Right? Yep, I agree. And, and that old term, you always hear it kind of tossed around. Those who did not want to lead are the ones who should lead. But a lot of that has to do with the very nature of peasants rebelling for their rights. And then a peasant leader, which is the actual term for somebody rising to revolt, the peasant leader ends up becoming a future lord or future king after the rebellion's over. It, it's phenomenal. Um, and I got to say, God bless the new map, because having that limit of three kilometer by three kilometer and having most of it be water was disheartening but i really feel like now that most of the map is land there's so much more and it's really not no. that big compared to other survival games no it's it's not but the way so this is an old trick that we know from the old games of the past uh old, old um is that they purposely reduce the speed of your characters to make it feel bigger so like if i were to put like a daisy character next to my life as fuel character that guy would be like sprinting miles ahead of my guy because the life is fuel character is slower so they made a three kilometer area feel like it's like a good like in the vanilla map like a good five kilometer area so in this larger map it really does feel like it's a lot bigger of a map it really fools you into thinking that which is a great aspect to a way a game works Right. I think the other thing I've noticed is, and from my perspective, I took a few years off of, from the game because I couldn't get my friend group interested in it. I will say that's probably one of the harder things about getting into Life of Feudal. If you don't have a group of players to, to enjoy the game with, I don't feel like you're actually getting the essence of the game itself. If you try to go in there and you join a server that allows you max skill cap and you're just solo on your own with your own village, I think you're kind of missing the point. But one thing that was also a little hard for my friends to wrap their head around was the control system. And I was nervous that since I forgot so much of the game that I would be terrible at it. Uh, but it's crazy how intuitive it is, honestly. Once you learn yeah. the steps, picking up from A, dropping it to B, picking up from B to C, it just kind of comes to you. It feels natural. It has a lot of layers, but the layers are easily navigated because the way they set up the layers to be navigated was a drop-down menu kind of system, which may be a little bit game-breaking at times, or immersion-breaking, I would say. Uh, but honestly, 
it's like you said intuitive it makes the game feel fun because you're not struggling to figure out do i push uh alt and right click and then left click at the mm -hmm. same time now you just look at it click right click and then go to the option you wish to use um again i know it could be immersive immersion breaking but i think if it was any more complicated it would take all of the beauty of the game and just ruin it right it kind of feels like they they uh and i know the mmo is a touchy subject but it even feels like from the first life is futile it was kind of designed with an mmo's interface with the drop menus versus a beautiful interface and the more i thought about it if it was made to look good if it was made with different windows different pop-ups it would be too much i think that would actually be more immersion breaking yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I can actually speak about the MMO thing real quick. Life is Futile, folks, don't uh, get it wrong, was made from the ground up to be the test bed for the MMO of Life is Futile. Life is Futile itself was always meant to become a full-fledged MMO. However, when it became an MMO, the publishing company and the people who developed Life is Futile had, unfortunately, some legal issues as well as they got a little bit tomfoolery, but we're not going to get into that. But what happened is the MMO actually did try to make the UI better. And honestly, if you ever look up the UI yarn with the MMO and everything else, it's far, far more complicated. And honestly, oh if you're not willing to do it, you won't. You just don't have the patience for this. But it is important to note, that, folks, that this entire time we've been talking, we've been talking about Life is Fuel your own, not the MMO at all. We're mm -hmm. not playing the MMO. This is the standalone game. You can still buy it on Steam. This has nothing to do with uh, long tail games, I believe. And it's a, it's a fantastic standalone. If you can get at least a group of four to play with, um, I think that you'll be enjoying it so much. With that being said, uh, before we go to our hot takes, what's a funny moment from our times playing it that you want to plug? I think it that was you me. can plug. <laughs> <laughs> oh there, there were some after hours oh yes yeah. there were some after hours conversations that we'll just keep to ourselves <laughs> uh but i think one of the funniest moments was uh when uh we set up the the dummy for uh dimension to th t practice his slinging on and i ended up becoming the dummy because he can't hit a standing dummy worth crap <laughs> yeah, was that like, was funny oh, too because oh. he's like how did i get destruction xp i look over and the dummy is in front of my house great guys thanks <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it, there was a lot of a lot of good humor in there uh and it was it was actually a lot of fun because we all started to connect the dots and everything else and i think a lot of the humor honestly folks was subtle humor little cracks here little jabs there just kind of like what you would do if you're sitting around playing poker or going bowling with someone or whatever else that's right. how it felt with me I think my my favorite funny part from those streams was how we were gradually trying to frustrate Dimension, and it wasn't intentional at first, but you could tell that we were really just shooting the piss out of them as we went on, because we were like, hey, okay, now, we, now we, you need to do this. We need this made. So he'd start working and constructing, and then we're like, where's our meat? We're hungry. And then he'd be like, okay, well, then I'll go get meat. You were gone too long, so now we had to do this. What the heck? And we just kept on adding more tasks to Dimension mention and then at the end hazing him when his levels weren't high enough even though it wasn't his fault <laughs> oh I, I know i know i know another funny moment it's 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 like a do double layered one so when i first was teaching dimension how to do terraforming he started to create this like snake path of flattened earth and i'm all like what are you doing bro just flatten the square area just 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 fix it and he was like you're yelling at me i don't want to do this anymore so fast forward to our last session, and we're trying to get his construction skill up. And paving the 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 ground is a great way. And he was all like, I don't know, I don't want to mess it up. You're going to yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we just yelled at him for other stuff that wasn't even his fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well thank you so much for that that's been a blast i cannot wait to play again i really do enjoy playing that game with you but uh let's get over to our hot takes what say you <laughs>
My hot take is a little more upfront about all the releases that have been coming out this summer. Um, I, ha I had to write a long paragraph just so that I could get my thoughts in line without sounding too preachy. We have a lot of titles coming out this year. Uh, I mean, even Elden Ring comment. released earlier this year. And uh, <laughs> one of the titles that came out that kind of took the world by storm was Baldur's Gate 3. And of course, when Baldur's Gate 3 came out, the devs came out saying how it's impossible to expect other companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The one thing that it's done is it's created a polarity in the fan base where fans are now attacking each other. They're now uh, propping games way in the overhype area, and they're also pooping on games that they haven't even seen anything about or haven't even played. And the one thing that I got to say about this whole mentality is we should embrace the fact that we're getting a lot of releases this year. That is an exciting thing. It feels like the last four years we've kind of hit a drought. So just remember, folks, it's OK to not like something. It's OK to love something. Not everybody is going to like or love the other thing. But instead of wasting your efforts going around and yucking other people's yums for a title that you're probably not even going to play, Instead, find people in communities that like the same games as you, because I guarantee you that's other alternatives. That goes for Baldur's Gate 3. That goes for Starfield. It goes for Enshrouded. I mean, it was even around when Elden Ring released. Just remember, we are gamers together. We form the same community. We are the consumers. It's OK not to like a title that someone else does. And that doesn't make you bad if you don't like it. What makes you bad is if you try to drag other people down with you in your unhappiness. That's my hot take. Yeah, I can definitely, I can definitely agree on that kind of stuff. That like, if you don't play a game and everything else, Jarl, I totally agree. You should kind of reserve your judgment until you actually try it out, until you've given the game a chance. And that could be as easy as just watching people play the game for quite a while before you do so. But doing it out the gate or before the game even releases, it seems like you're casting the stone before you see the enemy. Maybe it doesn't right. really exist. Yeah, um, I mean, like, uh, I've had a lot of friends who loved Elden Ring. Oh, we got a comment. Oh, yeah. Oh, the stream says, Baldur's Gate? Never heard of it. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, well, yeah, surely. This is a Never. I'm going to throw him under the bus here because I, I know I know this guy always streams, huh? Me and him are friends. Yeah, yeah. He called in sick to work. Yeah, don't know Baldur's Game, my butt. <laughs> you know what, though? I got to say, as a manager, I, I manage a pizza place, and I always <laughs> identified who the gamers were and who the movie folks were. And I always approached him and said, do you need a day off for the release of the movie? Do you need a day off for the release of the game? I know when it's coming out, I'd rather schedule you off instead of you calling out sick. I don't blame you at all for that. I just think that corporations need to learn that. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I had to do that. I'm sorry. I love you always, streams. <laughs> uh, by the way, the unsubscribe to Dump Gras YouTube is always an option. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So getting over to my hot take. So... As you all well know, we in the podcast are always trying to improve ourselves and to make things better. However, one of the many things that we have noticed going over our analytics and pouring over all the other kind of data we do have is that it seems like a lot of our listeners are really into Day Z. And while we really appreciate that and we're really happy to have you folks here, we want to know what would it take for you guys to be interested in other games? What kind of things would pique your interest or... What kind of topics would you like to hear about? Because overall, we are a survival game podcast, and we are trying to help and grow by talking about these other kind of games and really dive into them. While we still love and enjoy DayZ, we know there are many elements of DayZ that exist out there in many other kinds of games. So folks, go ahead and comment down below in our, our description in our video and let us know what do you think we could change in our podcasts or the way we do our videos to make it so maybe you, as a Daisy lover and a viewer, would be more willing and wanting to watch some of the other productions that we're willing to talk about. That's kind of what I got. Absolutely. Thank you, Dump. Short, sweet, to the point, and I like it. And if you do love Daisy, one way you could help us is tell us why you love it. 
because that's one of the best ways to branch off to other survival games is finding other survival games that share a lot of similar traits and behaviors. But Definitely. without further ado, let's talk about Sengoku Dynasty, which is more my style of game. At its core, Sengoku Dynasty is a multi-genre game combining an open world RPG feel to survival elements to even city management. And it's been done before with Medieval Dynasty, as well as the Wild West Dynasty Alpha that's out. Set in feudal Japan, the game offers a unique world for solo play, co-op play with your friends, as well as offering the third person camera right off the bat that honestly the devs of the Dynasty genre tend to implement last. Uh, which gives you a lot of variety, including two different third-person view models. But let's talk about how it stands as a survival game dump. And I'm sure the one thing that you'll notice is that you've got these survival metrics. You know, you have to sleep uh, and, you know, you have to eat. Uh, but the one thing that seems to be missing is the ability to drink water. But at its core, it does make a really decent survival alpha. Um, I know that in the early access, not all of the implements have been added to Sengoku Dynasty, but how do you feel about its future as a survival game in its current state? I think it has to take a hard turn to become more survival-ish than it is now. Right now, it is easy mode survival. I don't think I even really paid attention to my hunger other than realizing my stamina didn't refresh very fast. Like, mm -hmm. I think the only time I ever cared about my health was when there was a boar, and it was literally when a boar killed me. Um, which, that was kind of funny, having so many boars attack us. But, <laughs> honestly... That was nuts. It was nuts. Honestly, though... Uh, as much as I like Medieval Dynasty, and I would call Medieval Dynasty a survival game, Sengoku Dynasty, in its launch, is not a survival game with basic needs. Thirst, water, hunger, foods, um, even sleep. Like, I think the only reason we slept was just to make it daytime. So, right. I think it has promise, but I think right now, it's not. That's actually a really good point that you bring up, because I think what really kind of threw that off balance for me was the co-op. Um, illnesses. Medieval Dynasty did not focus on disease. I mean, they had a poison meter for eating improperly prepared food, as well as rotten food. They had an alcohol meter if you get drunk to kind of represent illness. Uh, but you don't, in either game, really catch colds or disease. Um, I noticed that some of the foods in... Sengoku Dynasty, you can eat raw with no negative effect. I think that it's gone a long ways to go, but my only concern is that maybe if you look at Medieval Dynasty, I don't think they're going to go far enough. If Medieval Dynasty had fatigue from not sleeping and had diseases or colds that you can get, I really think it would ramp that need for sleep, food, and water up a lot. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's a lot of cool merits to a survival game. I actually did a video about the 10 things that make a survival game. Food, hunger, and sleep are not essential for a survival game to be a survival game. There can be other elements, like you're always talking about environmental threats. You're always talk We've talked about so many other kinds of things. You know, open world, crafting, building, and Sudoku has a lot of them. But a basic necessity system does need to be in place. And while this is a very early release of the game, and I guarantee you, illness, like you're saying, Jarl, if they do start implementing that, or even just doing that poison system that you talked about, I think will be quite more beneficial to the game in the future. Yeah, and, and drinking water. Oh! One thing I was going to say, I don't know if you guys noticed, um, but you don't actually die in Sengoku Dynasty. It says you are gravely injured or badly injured and you need to rest. And then you're sent back to the equivalent of the coast. But you still have all your gear. Your your health is lowered, but it comes back up. But again, you don't actually die. That is a very good point. And I was thinking about it this weekend. What would I change to make it more of a ramification if you died? I know your equipment degrades, 
Uh, in fact, I died with, uh, after you guys had logged off, I had gotten a metal spear, which I'll talk about later. And I died, and its quality went down when I died. And that sucked, because I didn't have a way to make iron equipment. But if I did, that would have been no big deal. I have one solution to the co-op game world that could fix that. If you die, you should be required to lay in your bed for a certain amount of time, like a resurrection timer. And if everybody's dead, then it just progresses to the next day and everybody's awake. So you lose a whole day of work. I think if they did something like that, they could make it more beneficial. Or heck, even nerfing your dynasty score for dying or even the experience that you've gathered up that you're pumping into skills. I think it would be interesting to have you take an experience burn if you die. What do you think, Dump? I don't know. I think waiting in bed on a co-op might be actually more problematic than actually just dying. Um, and what I mean by dying is when you die, you know, uh, I know the gear takes a hit, but like, honestly, I'm always, I'm okay with the tried and true method of you lose your gear. It truly makes going into situations or exploring, if you don't want to have to run back for it, uh, when you do die, you try your hardest not to die. If I always respawn with my gear, even if it's a lower uh, uh, health stage after I die, I don't really get that sense of gear fear. Uh, it's right. something we talk about a lot in DayZ. Gear fear is a great motivator in a lot of survival games. Mm -hmm. And now DayZ is highly unforgiving. If you can't get you to back to your body in less than half an hour, it's gone. It doesn't matter. It's just poop. Um, so I think in Sengoku, there are two things that should be done to improve this. One, when you die, maybe treat it like RuneScape. You can favorite three items, and those three items you always keep. That way, you can always favorite, like, a, a spear or something, right? And then two, make it so if you do die on the way to your gear... The gear that you originally died with, let's call it Death 1, still stays there, but then there's another gear for Death 2. Now, this might make multiple grave areas for you to try to get to, but one of the things I hate most about dying in survival games that are outside of the hardcore survival is when you die, and then it deletes your old gear to make, create a new grave. And I think right. that's what a lot of people hate about dying and losing all your gear is they are afraid that if they die again on the way to the gear they're not going to get that gear original gear back you know that's a great point you make and once they implement the proper decay system that medieval dynasty has your idea would actually fix it when you drop gear in medieval dynasty it decays especially in bad weather so if you had to worry about running back to your grave rearming up just so you could kill those boars or bandits that are around your body then gathering some friends to go get it, there is that sense of urgency. And if you died again trying to get it and you had to start over again, there's a chance that by the time you got to your first body's gear, a lot of the stuff you had on you might might be in real bad condition. So that's actually a really clever way to fix it. Awesome. Yeah. Or you're going to be a fool like Jarl. I guarantee Jarl, when he we play with him with his iron spear, he's going to throw it into a boar, and a boar's going to kill him, and the boar's just going to run off with his spear in its back. I'm going to tell you right now one of the things that I, I didn't... This was not even a thought for me until we all played together, because how I play the Dynasty games is that if one person in the group dies, we all have to start over. Completely. I always play in permadeath. But I think that's because those Dynasty games do lack that gear fear. They do lack that punishment of, you died, you know, big whoop. But for me, the whole point of the Dynasty games is you have a kid and you raise him up to 18. And then when you die, you take over as your child. That, to me, is the whole point of those games. So I'd like to see something a little more punishing. That being said, let's talk about resource scarcity. Here you arrive at this island that's got a famine issue but you definitely don't feel that the moment you log in resources are plentiful it's easy to get we had a stockpile of food relatively quick and uh <laughs> i didn't really think about this until i started playing on my first world that i had when i got into winter although the resources do seem overly plentiful the you will burn through the food you've accumulated at an accelerated rate in the winter time and winter can be devastating. In the cold, 
your stamina is capped. You could be affected by it. You have to wear warmer clothing. And it just feels like being able to grab meat, berries, mushrooms, wherever you go. I think it kind of softened our experience because once winter came and I was not ready for it, I did not see a clear way to make it to the next spring to start year two unless I stole from people, which is a phenomenal aspect of the game. But it's just a shame that it comes in so late. If if you play it the first couple hours, you're like, this is too easy. What, what's the catch? Well, if you don't start planting crops that spring, you're in trouble. Okay, okay. So I actually haven't been able to have the privilege of dying to winter yet. So it does kind of uh, play an interesting fact. That maybe the reason why I thought the food and hunger uh, system was so easy was because I actually hadn't made it made it to winter, and I didn't realize that like you probably did didn't that stockpiling was actually a, probably a good idea. But this is an interesting fact to think about because it really puts a presence on seasons in this game, just like I believe in medieval mm -hmm. dynasty, um, where. You don't think about the resource scarcity because it's so plentiful, but if you don't take advantage of that plentiful bounty, you're going to be screwed like Yara was during winter. And that's an interesting fact overall that I actually think kind of changes my opinion on this a little bit more to it might be a little bit more of a survival game than I actually originally said a little bit earlier. So that's kind of cool to hear about. Yeah, and it's, it's a little different, too, because when you get a community built, in order to have, like, really good armor, metal weapons and stuff, because once you progress through the prologue, the banditry skyrockets. Um, now, I haven't made it to that point. I just watched a YouTube video where several people made it past that prologue, and then it shows you this really cool fly-by camera shot. But the problem is, is your community members eat food, and they need water. They need water. <laughs> and if they're not happy in the village they leave but the thing that sucks about that is they build up skill points the more they work for you and in the later part of the game where you're needing iron bars and you're needing to pay taxes and you're needing to to go buy stuff it's very important to have that final product made and you can't possibly do it on your own you need the community your little npc village to make that work well in the winter time half my village left they got mad and left and I was left in the spring with unskilled workers who couldn't plant more than just the basic crops. It was so frustrating. So it's oh, one of those uh, weird titles where you have to plan so far ahead, lest you get screwed in the end. Definitely. Sounds like it. I did also notice that in the summertime, I got like little heat indicators like maybe the day was really hot and in the cold i got cold indicators and it seemed like my stamina couldn't refill for beans so when it came to fighting boars or bandits i was very underprepared uh but maybe there could be a better way like in medieval dynasty they explain it to you through quests in the alpha of sengoku there's not a whole lot going on in that aspect uh but maybe there would have been a better way to to portray that Which brings me to my next thing, the thing I love about it. Although it might not be the hardest survival, the lore in these games are very good. And that brings us to the Peasant Kingdom. Uh, in the story, you and your friend Aiko are shipwrecked on the beach. Um, you have nothing to your name, and you decide to go to the nearest village for help. And the first thing you say is, oh, is, is this the Peasant Kingdom? And their entire village is burned. And they don't trust you because you're a refugee. So before you can even start recruiting skilled people in your village, you have to go do stuff for people to kind of build up that dynasty rep so that they'll join your village. Yeah, definitely. It's actually kind of cool because they, um, when you first get to the, the beach, you meet Echo meet, um, and you end up <laughs> threatening her. <laughs> Is she meat? I was not prepared. <laughs> we were talking about the bounty of food. And we couldn't eat for the first couple days, so we were looking at her like a potential meal. It was dark. <laughs> Is she meat? Um, gameplay wise, but uh, 
it, you help her out. You make a campfire for her. You make a shelter. You she forcefully gives you fish, cooked fish, uh, which hey, she does have meat on her. Uh, so we weren't wrong. Um, but uh, the guy that is in that picture uh, looks like he's standing next to uh, Burn Village. Shichi is your first. Shichi, that guy. Um, <laughs> and uh, he actually even mentions he saw you helping her. Which actually brings me to an interesting question. I want to know, uh, in the comments below, uh, has anybody ever not helped her? And does the dialogue change? Hmm, that's it's, interesting. Tachiki uh, mentions he saw you helping her and he um, had a bad opinion of you until he saw you helping her and then it changed. It's interesting you bring that up because I know you. we haven't really gotten to explore the story as a podcast group because we were, well, the place we chose apparently was where all the boars spawn. So literally a, a third of our experience was boars are attacking the village. Oh my God, get all these pigs out of here. Maybe that's why we didn't have a food problem <laughs> was because we were constantly under siege by pigs. Uh, but the idea is that famine has spread throughout. You have a very short amount of time to get yourself prepared for winter. And the best way to do that is to immediately dive in the quests and start helping people. And that brings me to one of my favorite quests in the very beginning. Since the famine is going around, as a result, bandits are nuts in the area and there is no law to crack down on the crime. So the people are kind of left to fend for themselves, which immediately makes everybody a little distrustful of new faces. They portray that well because we found a, a guy in a watchtower that said bandit. And, and you, Red, and I were like, let's kill that guy. Let's get him. And we grabbed our wooden spears and ran up there. But then once we talked to him, we realized he wasn't a bandit. He was actually a ronin. Had a really cool storyline. But I like the idea that it's like enemy. Just just hostile enemy until you break bread with them and then realize they're not. There's a quest in the game when you're trying to help Toshichi. Um, and actually, let's go back one second. That is one of the coolest features of the game that they're all labeled as bandits until you talk to them. But I want to talk about something that really grinds my gears with this game. If you actually encounter a real hostile bandit, well, there's no mystery there because just like all the players in the game with their little icons above their head, he's got this kanji for bandit right above his head. There's, there's no mystery. You just see it moment he sees you he's like i'm evil and i'm gonna kill you and it was kind of like why did you do that like now i know who i can talk to and once i see that logo pop up i know i can attack him it seems unnecessary to replace the dude's name with bandit until we talk to him if we clearly know who the bandits are and who aren't what do, what do you think about that oh. there might be more to that mechanic than i think on the surface level we're seeing because, like, in real life, if you come up to somebody and they have murderous intent, you kind of know all, all right away. Like, I'm not talking about psychopath level where they, like, try to deceive you. I'm talking about, like, they really want what you have. They want your wallet or your gear or whatever, right? You instantly know you're in danger. I'm in danger, mm -hmm. but they know you know it. So I can see as you approach these people, um, hopefully you are approaching them, that they do turn into that. And your guy is more of a, instead of a, oh, this might be a stranger, it's a, oh crap, he wants to hurt me. This kind of situation. And that situation might end up playing out differently if they set up it right. Because if they change the distance in which that triggers for you, you might actually be like within five, um, 10 feet of him and then realize that you literally just walked into an entire bandit camp and now you're kind of effed. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see maybe they're kind of ironing out kinks, but I think overall the idea of everyone being called bandit or whatever until you actually approach them could actually be kind of a fun thing and make you way more hesitant to walk up to them in the first place. Right, and that's what I'm behind, right? I want that. In fact, when the bandit sees you, he makes a noise like and pulls out a weapon and takes a stance and comes at you. There is no mystery. But the problem that Dimension and I had is we walked into an ambush. And the only reason why we knew where they were in this huge forest of bamboo and bushes is because we could see the stupid bandit icon running through the bushes. Whereas in Medieval Dynasty, if you're being shot at by bandits, 
sometimes you got to hide behind a rock and poke your head out and go, where the hell are they? And get visual confirmation. But with that stupid bandit sign above his head, there was no mystery whatsoever. None. Now, I, I hate to always fall back on this, but I wonder if uh, the people who made Sudoku Dynasty, uh, Toplin Productions, put on the training wheels for the early access within the first couple updates. Because let's face it, folks, how many times have we played video games and in early access and died to something that we didn't understand and then we got all upset about it or blamed bugs or called it a glitch? Reality, it's not. I mean, it still happens to this day in Day Z. People get shot mm -hmm. from like 100 yards away through a door and they claim it's cheating. Um, so I can see them putting easy mode on for the first couple of updates and then like taking it away. I just wish there was an option to where you could disable that. You know, the, the, the icon or, uh, over the enemies. And if you're going to sit there and put a bandit icon to make the game easier, could you do that for the ninja boars that don't make any noise currently? Because the only time those boars snort is after they've stabbed you with their tusk. And I was walking and somebody's like, you're all, you have a boar on you. And I turn around and there were two chasing me and I had no idea. <laughs> None. So I, I totally agree with you on that. So uh, Toplin Production Games, I will totally voice the I'm in danger for the character to say whenever he's about to get attacked by a boar. <laughs> now, for those of you who would like a copy of Sengoku Dynasty or Medieval <laughs> Dynasty yourself, remember it's Toplitz, not Toplin. That's something totally different. Although the Toplin Institute is a great YouTube channel. Thanks for your input, Dump. I'm really sorry. appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I failed. Oh, I failed. No, so man, hard. I sure do like Project Zomboid with that Indi stone. It's so good. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I sure like you, BZ. <laughs> <laughs> but that does bring up a point that I really can't wait to explore with you is the honor and trust. Like you said, they don't they don't trust you right off the bat. And once you build the initial buildings and you build a house for Eiko, Toshichi kind of opens up to you and says, hey, there's a lot of people around here that need your help. And one of the very first things right next to Toshichi is the hut overlooking the water. And when you go to that hut, there's a gentleman laying down on a straw mattress and another gentleman outside. And this man is known as the impure. Um, so because of the... Uh, the cultural differences, the game does a good job explaining it to you, but the impure man is actually somebody who deals with the sick, the diseased, and the bodies after they die. And it's not seen as an offensive title. He's not impure because people detest him. He's impure because he deals with impure things, and it's his job to make sure that your spirit goes with your ancestors like it should, which is kind of a cool story. But it all comes down to a choice. Of course, you're given this choice by the impure man saying that this man went out. He basically, because of the famine, his family was starving. He's too old to work. He can't even fight anymore. So he decides to go off into the forest and take his own life by eating poisonous mushrooms. And he was expecting a quick death, but he did not get it. So instead, he is suffering on this mat. Matsumaru, the impure man, says that what we could do is we could make it painless for him, but still honor his wish to die, right? But then there's another woman near the village called Mata, who's an herbalist, who kind of tells you, listen, the family doesn't know where he is. The family doesn't want this. They're looking for him. And if you get me these ingredients, I can make a cure that might be successful. There's even a small chance that the cure will fail. So either way, he ends up dead. But it might be successful. But when you really weigh it, you have to consider what is the culture here? It's about honor and trust. And the way I interpreted it is that he chose to die. He, this is what he wanted to benefit his family. So do we save him or do we honor his wishes? What would you have done in that situation? <laughs> um, 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 I would have taken the medicine and let him die. Uh, I might need killing medicine? Oh, you would have <laughs> taken the medicine? You're like, I didn't eat no poisonous mushrooms, but I'm going to drink this. You just wait one sec. <laughs> what I do like ah. about the game is uh, if you are able to cure him with the antidote, his family is thankful. He 
is kind of bummed about it, but he does go back to his family filled with shame. But the community appreciates it because he didn't have to die, right? But there's still that small chance that he'll die. That's kind of like the bad one where you tried to save him. Uh oh. One question Is he mm -hmm. meat? He is, yes. <laughs> Poisoned meat. And you don't even have to worry about poison in this game, so have at. No, <laughs> no but it's, it's kind of cool. Medicine. Right? If you give him the antidote, there is the chance that he'll survive. There's the chance that he'll still die, and it will be very painful. In which case, everybody dislikes you. You went against his witches. You weren't able to help him, and he died a horribly painful death. And then there's the option I chose, which was to ease his suffering so that he could pass. Three paths, and they each have different ramifications on your dynasty rep and how people around the village interact with you. I think that's so cool. That is really cool. Now, I actually, reading uh, or hearing about this from Jarl, actually decided to go the warrior from, uh, what's his name, Topoliniki? Toshichi? Toshichi! <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I, I'm no, really you bad know what? at names. I'm not butchering on purpose. I was terrible with that name, too, at first. I'm like, well, it looks like Tashi Station from Star Wars. I know they say Toshi. And I'll just say chi afterwards. That's how my caveman brain says these things. I mean, I was going to say Tamagotchi, but that's totally wrong. <laughs> oh, if it was Tamagotchi, I'd forget to feed him and he'd die. That's that's my extent of experience there. <laughs> but I went down the warrior uh, villager to help. And it was kind of an interesting aspect because you end up finding this guy and uh, the gentleman that gives you the quest ends up telling you that, like, a lot of people don't like him. Some people like him, but not very many. He's kind of like a, I'm a bad butt kind of guy. Um, you know, and you get to him, and he tells you that his apprentice or whatever, he sent off hunting to uh, do some stuff, and he was a wimp or whatever else, probably cowering behind the hills. Well, you find his apprentice, and you find him finding out that his father taught him not to kill animals, and that he's deathly afraid of killing the animals, and this kind of goes back to the honor system that y'all was talking about, where it was his father who raised him this way, and he wishes to honor his father's wishes. Well, you volunteer to do it. It's not really optional. And then when you come to him, he tells you that he also wants it cooked. And then after you cook it, you go to him and you offer it to him, and he, you kind of have a dialogue option. And the dialogue option is, here's your meat, go back to him, whatever. But the other dialogue option is, this man is using you to feed himself. And it's kind of funny, because I did end up choosing the dialogue option of telling, telling him to go back. But it is kind of interesting that the NPCs are already deceiving each other after this horrible famine and burnt village, that this wannabe bad butt is deciding to take advantage of a younger uh, boy and forcing him to get the food because he isn't able to. Uh, so and it was you know what's cool story. about that too? What's really cool about that is if you look around that guy's place and you talk to him more, you realize that this wannabe bad butt is actually one of the former warriors of the Shogun that was displaced. So he has oh. no experience providing his own food. <laughs> ah, see? Uh, we have a new... Oh, you know what, Dump? Why don't you handle this? Uh, since you can say Tushichi. Hello. This is always streams. And you know what? It roughly translates to... Leaves chat. I'm not no, going to no, say no. the I first word. I think you missed up the kanji there. I believe it says, Go to State of Survival and hit that subscribe and like button. Thank you, always streams. It's nice to have a member of our community promoting us in such an affectionate way. Actually, you know what? Speaking about promotion, folks always streams in our chat right there. Actually shouted this out in his own personal community tab in his YouTube about our Daisy 1.22 video, and it has been a lovely thing to see. So thank you very much, always streams. Yes, and he's streaming right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's always um, streaming. Always streaming. And watch the sleeping um, vids. I know we touched up on farming before, and the importance of it but what i've noticed about the boar coming this close to your settlement that didn't happen in medieval dynasty when you establish the settlement some of those animals would keep their distance 
Uh, but it's really made me realize that farming's not going to be as easy. You can't just put a bunch of naked plots next to each other and fill them up with seed. Um, you have to fence everything in. Like, if you don't want those boars attacking you while you're working or your settlers, it really gives you reason to have the fences. Whereas before, they were merely cosmetic. When you're thinking about farming, um, how in-depth do you want a farming system? Uh, a farming system should be... should have a simplistic surface with a more detail beneath. Uh, underground, right? Um, I love systems where it looks easy on the surface, but once you start getting into it, you realize that there's a little bit more complex mechanics in there, like does fertilizing your fields yield higher uh, crop growth or better vegetables? Do, um, do you have to move where you plant your vegetables, like cycle your crops? You have to do other kind of things. But like surface level, you might just have to plow the field uh, put the seeds in, water them, and keep watering them until they grow. But once you hit that level of, okay, I'm at the surface level now, what's underneath? I always love finding that stuff, no matter what mechanic it is. My favorite thing about Medieval Dynasty, and I hope they bring it over to Sengoku soon, is the events. It very much is a sim simpler farming system. You know, you grub up the soil, you fertilize it, you plow it, you sprinkle your seed on it, and you wait for it to grow. At least with Sengoku, you have to protect it, because as we've seen, the boars will come in. But it's so cool that it is a little... I, I call it mediocre. You know, it's medium difficulty. It's not, like, as easy as Minecraft. There's a little more to it. But at the same time, some of the events that you play in Medieval Dynasty, it's like, oh, no, our crop failed. And then you walk into the next day, like... I have to plant all of this again in one more day before summer. Otherwise, I'm going to miss my window of opportunity. I think once we get those events, we're going to see a lot more of that complexity come out. And uh, one thing I hope for with those events, though, is the beauty and art that make up this game. It is really... And I'm not talking graphical beauty. I'm talking the aesthetic beauty of it. Um... There are cinematics in this game that are told through watercolor paintings. They get painted as you're watching the cinematic. That's something unique to this game because Medieval Dynasty doesn't have cutscenes where you get to see this artwork with the exception of the events. Um, but it kind of helps plunge you into the immersion of the historical world. It can help motivate you to accomplish tasks, uh, make you feel like you're building your ancestry up by achieving certain things. Did you find the cinematics kind of deterred you? Like, in a survival game, that's not a very common thing to have. Um, I felt indifferent about them because they were short enough that they were not bothersome, but they also were nice to see and easy to look at. I don't think I actually would say focused on them too hard, but... Again, it didn't take away from the survival game for me. Now, if I had to sit through like a five-minute cinematic, I might be a very different opinion. But this is like 30 seconds at max. 30 seconds, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's one bad thing about it, though. The cinematic only shows to the player who triggered it. When Dimension and I went exploring and he found a shrine, which is one of the objectives that you have that Toshiji gives you, he opened the shrine and he got to see the cinematic. But because the shrine was already opened, I did not. So I was missing a piece of the story of the peasant kingdom because he got to it first. Now, I was blessed enough to have played this game before I invited you guys to the to try it. So I had already seen these. But when I tried to watch it again, I realized I couldn't. And I think that they need to fix that in a patch soon because it's such a unique thing to have these old 30 second cinematics. Yeah, definitely. And of course, we can't talk about the beauty of the game until you talk about the actual structures and architecture. We saw shrines with the red gates, beautiful and highly decorated. And I wondered to myself, do you get to build those? You do. As you get your technology and your dynasty up in your town, the gates start off like wooden gates where it's just some beams, kind of like almost like a Western saloon. It's just like a beam with a sign on it that says, OK, Corral. 
you upgrade from that to those elaborate, beautiful red arches. And honestly, it just the beauty of the world and how it's designed, being able to look out at the valleys filled with uh, fog or evanescence and seeing the smoke from the buildings while you have this arch kind of center framing the whole thing. It was just gorgeous. And I love the fact that they're giving you the ability to make a beautiful place because in European medieval design, it was utilitarian. It was built to serve a purpose. When you build these historical settlements, what is your kind of favorite aesthetic? Do you want it to be utilitarian or are you going for beauty, like something to impress? Well, um, kind of my own personal opinion about this when it comes to how I wish to build in these kind of games is I'm a planner, but I'm also a person who was a blacksmith. And I at first thought that I would make something for utility and then make it pretty. And when I got taught by some of the most ma some of the mo uh, master blacksmiths that I worked with um, at the hammer ins that we went to, was that if you actually create something with beauty first and then transform that beauty to become utility, you can create some most some beautiful pieces of art while still having something just as useful as if you started from the useful part. So that's yeah, kind of how I like that, that fantasy blade, kind of like when you get a Bud K magazine and you're like, oh, look at this fantasy spear. And it looks like something out of Final Fantasy nine. And then you're like, look at this historically accurate med medieval spear. And it's very basic. I would imagine that blacksmiths would have to compete if, if you lived in a clustered enough area. And having that like beauty, but still functionality would be super important. Well, I guess uh, one of the examples I could give is if you look at uh, hinges, I iron hinges, big, long tentacles, they can be super basic. They have, can have just a basic clover or they literally can just be a point, a come to a point or just be a piece of square bar. But when you make it for pretty, you can make it so it has that clover and it's a bunch of uh, pummeling, which is, you know, all those little divots on the surface of it. And then you can maybe do a little bit of scroll work on it. It's still just as useful as the basic one. It's just you spent a little bit more time on it, which honestly means you could charge more. So, yeah, uh, I get what you mean. It's not like a fantasy blade in my view, or like that's not how I build. I wouldn't build mm -hmm. like a fantasy kind of blade. I would build a spear, but instead of building a spear that looked very plain and um, basic, I might actually do a little bit of etching with a tool into it, make it a little bit more... Nick. Yeah. Well, with that being said, let's go over a few more points that I think is definitely something that we should touch on to when it comes to the game. Co-op day one is huge. And I do like the fact that they put co-op in there. And I do like the iconography above the players' heads. In fact, uh, we're going to be showing a screenshot here of uh, Dump Grand Dimension standing in front of my home. Very clearly labeled who's who. And by the way, this screenshot also is right before we got attacked by an army of boar. Uh, but they were moving around so fast to fit in themselves, I couldn't get a good picture of their names. It is really good to have that day one, but my God, getting it to work the first time was really rough. So that's something I hope they improve on. Um, yeah. And I do like the fact that it seems like you need multiple tools to do jobs, whereas Medieval Dynasty was like the one ax did everything lumber working. So it is cool because we had Red sitting there with the ads and he was turning them into planks while we were bringing logs. I really felt that kind of enhanced that co-op need. Uh, but one thing I wanted to talk about that you weren't around for is Dimension and I found a hot springs and they're like, get naked, buy some drinks, buy some sake and go inside. He went into the hot springs while I was talking to this lady. And when he came out, his skin was red. Your skin changes color depending on the temperature. Whether it's hot he turned or turned into a devil, he did. He turned into a devil, and I had to put him down. It was it was absolutely mandatory. Um, but it was good running around and being able to see the different weapons, the metal spears, and it kind of gave me hope on what we could create. And now it makes me kind of want to go back in there. I think you're going to have fun as a blacksmith. All the little things you can make, super super fun. But with that being said, we did ask the community 
with Sengoku Dynasty being co-op in the alpha release, it brought up an interesting question between us. Do you prefer co-op that's introduced in early access, even if it's rough? Or do you prefer co-op introduced after the game is refined, uh, when it is more stable, like Medieval Dynasty? And we actually got somebody's perspective on this, uh, which I really appreciated. Uh, of course, it's Dimension, right? And uh, Dimension actually said, personally, he preferred the co-op early, mostly because he enjoys survival games with others. So if survival comes out that's solo, he's less likely to play it than if it's co-op or multiplayer. And I hear that a lot. Yeah. It's really cool. I mean, I totally agree with him. Uh, the co-op can really make you muddle over some of the bugs or some of the other annoyances of an early access game because you're just having so much fun with your friends. I think the only time that early access co-op can be detrimental is if the co-op is so badly, uh, you know, optimized for net coding that you're lagging all the time and there's huge issues and everything else. We experienced that very little in Sudoku Dynasty, but it was a little bit there over time, which always happens with uh, locally hosted games. Um, but we did get another comment actually on our YouTube, uh, Jarl, uh, from Helkiana which uh, some people may know her from DayZ and some from her other aspects. She goes, from a developer's perspective, it's best to start with a co-op from the very beginning. Making systems work with co-op after they have been finished, um, after uh, work with co-op after they've been finished, it can lead to a lot of issues down the road if they didn't do so. This is both from a design and code perspective, but it might increase the initial development length by a bit for the game. Yeah, I do agree with that. I mean, look at Medieval Dynasty. They have to make a completely different map just to facilitate co-op because their first map wasn't really designed with co-op in mind. So that that's a really good point. But uh, that's all we have on Sengoku so far. We're hoping to have more once the game's fleshed out. I think it's safe to say, my opinion, just loving the Dynasty series, that it's going to be a good game. But I do feel like what I got from it, I will shelve until there's a little more to it. I feel like if I played it any more than I already have, I'm going to hit a dry spell. But uh, let's go ahead and see what Dave has to say about this. Uh, so, Dave, are, are you there? Do you hear us, buddy? Oh, Dave. Hey, how's it going? Uh, we would like to first apologize for not playing a survival game with zombies in it um, or infected. Um, Oh, it looks like you're learning the language. Uh, can you say Toshichi? That's closer than Dump got. Thank you. <laughs> Is he saying to the video? He probably. No, kill the video. I think he's trying to tell us we're running a little long, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. Dave, what's your next location? What's your next plans? Hmm. Sounds like he's thrilled to be working with us, Dump. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. We appreciate all the input you bring to these episodes. <laughs> ah, well, what do we have coming up for us next week, Dump? Well, uh, we're going to be returning on the 12th because, folks, we have gone to a bi-weekly episode schedule, but... Next time we are back on the 12th, we are going to be talking to the very person who just commented on our YouTube question, Helkiana. Helkiana is a wonderful and prevalent member, a part of the Daisy community, has made many fabulous mods, and has been prevalent in helping nurture and put forward the Daisy modding community into the future, which has been really awesome. She also has developed her own Unreal a survival um develop your own survival game in the Unreal Engine. And that's actually what we're going to be talking to her about, along with many other things. So I'm really excited to talk to her because she is an amazing person to talk to, and she streams regularly playing many survival games herself. So I'm really interested to see all of her perspectives, and I can't wait to talk to her, folks. I hope to see you all folks then. Ta-ta for now. Ta-ta!
Thank you for coming by and watching our show today. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. We really appreciate it. Also, don't forget to check out Yarl of Goats on Twitch when he is live and Red Falcon and his amazing work in the Daisy community. Without these two, the show would not be the same. I hope you all have a wonderful day.